The German victory over France and the Low Countries in the spring of 1940 was one of the most spectacular military victories the world had seen to date. In just six weeks, the Germans achieved something that their forefathers had fought for four years to do without any success. The total collapse of the French army and the capitulation of the nation which it served. In order to understand the events of that summer, we need to look at how each side's respective plans developed in the years and months beforehand. For France, their planning for the confrontation with Germany was dictated by a deep-rooted defensive mentality, embodied by the extensive fortifications of the Maginot Line erected along France's border with Germany. As a result, French plans for war focused on defending an invasion, leaving them essentially incapable of mounting a significant offensive once war broke out, aside from a minor excursion into the Saarland in support of Poland. The Allies were content to wait, rearm and prepare for the inevitable German attack. In terms of strategy for defending such an attack, the French High Command, led by its Commander-in-Chief Maurice Gamelin, remained convinced that the main German offensive thrust would come through central Belgium, in particular the strategically vital flat terrain of the Gembleu Gap between Wavre and Namur that was seen as the ideal point for German panzer units to attempt to break through into northern France. To counter this perceived threat, the Allies formulated Plan D, which involved creating a buffer zone between the Wehrmacht and France by advancing into Belgium and taking up defensive positions along the River Dill, where it was thought that the German advance could be halted. The best Allied troops would be stationed here, with lower priority given to the regions of the Ardennes and the Maginot Line, where it was seen as very unlikely that their opponents would launch a major offensive. As 1940 began, the French, encouraged by intelligence reports, decided to further commit to the core assumption made by Plan D. Gamelin decided to improve an extension, which would see the French 7th Army, then the most powerful formation held in reserve, advancing north to link up with the Dutch Army in the vicinity of the town of Breda. This Breda variant was designed to prevent the Netherlands from being cut off by the Wehrmacht in the initial stages of the campaign, and although it was accused of overcommitting to the north and leaving the Allies exposed in other parts of the front, it was nonetheless adopted. The Allied plan was an embodiment of the French methodical battle doctrine, aiming to draw the Germans into a slow-moving, protracted battle of attrition, where entrenched Allied troops in static front lines could grind the Germans down over an extended campaign much like the war a generation earlier. To achieve this, by May 1940, the Allies arranged a force of four and a half million men, including troops from France, Britain, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. These troops would wield 14,000 guns, 4,200 tanks, and over 5,000 aircraft, though less than 1,500 of these were actually combat ready for Plan D. The approach of the Germans to this campaign could not have been more different to that taken by the French. Following the defeat of Poland at the start of October 1939, Hitler had been keen to invade the West as soon as possible, initially seeking an invasion date before the end of 1939, even though the Germans had extremely large equipment shortages re resulting from the fighting in the East. The initial plans for the offensive involved the Wehrmacht's main strength being massed on its northern flank, sweep through central Belgium and attack south towards the River Somme, in many ways, it was a rerun of the Schlieffen plan used in 1914, but without the ambitious aim of encircling Paris. Hitler, who was looking for a decisive blow to be dealt to France early on, was unhappy with this approach. As bad weather forced the repeated postponement of the invasion and 1939 turned into 1940, the Nazi leader was drawn to an alternative strategy championed by General Erich von Manstein. Manstein proposed that the strongest panzer units should instead be concentrated in the Ardennes region to advance and outflank from the south the Allied forces that would advance to meet German troops in Belgium. Despite initial scepticism at such a bold use of panzer forces, this idea gained traction in the German high command and was formally adopted in February 1940. Codenamed Case Yellow, the German final offensive plan involved approximately two and a quarter million troops wielding 7,300 guns, 2,500 aircraft, all of which were operational, and 2,400 tanks. 
The German troops were marshalled into three army groups, helpfully labelled A, B and C. Army Group B had the dual task of both knocking the Netherlands out of the war as quickly as possible, and advancing into central Belgium to fix the Allied armies in place. To this end it deployed the 18th Army in the north and the 6th Army in the south, with three panzer divisions split between them. Crucial to the German invasion was keeping the Allies convinced that the main German effort was being directed in Army Group B's sector, and to this end the bulk of the Luftwaffe's initial effort would be concentrated in support of these troops, and German airborne units would be used to expedite the advance into the Low Countries. At the other end of the German front, the smallest of the German army groups, Army Group C, was tasked with exerting pressure on the troops defending the Maginot Line and pinning them in place, helping to protect the flank of the crucial advance taking place just to the north. Carrying out this advance was Army Group A, featuring seven panzer divisions, of which five and three motorised divisions were arranged into an independent armoured group named after its commander, Paul Ludwig von Kleist. With over 750,000 troops, Army Group A was by far the most powerful formation in the German army and was tasked with executing the most important part of the German offensive, the armoured push through Belgium and Luxembourg in the heavily wooded Ardennes region, aiming to surprise and overwhelm the second-rate French troops entrenched on the River Meuse. Fourth Army was charged with advancing to the Meuse and crossing at Dinan, while the 12th Army, complete with Panzer Group Kleist, was to advance and cross the Meuse at Sedan, the Schwerpunkt of the entire German invasion. The German plan was high risk but had the potential for high reward. If German panzers were able to cross the Meuse in force and surprise the Allies, they could potentially outflank the entire Allied advance, taking place to the north and spell mortal danger for the French troops. With the plans of the respective sides finalised, at 9pm on the 9th of May, the code word Danzig was relayed to all relevant German units, signalling that the offensive was to begin at 0345 the following morning. In the opening hours of the invasion, the Luftwaffe took centre stage, with bombers targeting Allied airfields and destroying dozens of enemy planes before they could even get into the sky gaining a crucial early advantage in the air war that the Allies struggled to recover from. At the same time, Gliderborn troops succeeded in landing on the roof of the crucial Belgian fort at Ebenemel, neutralising its guns and blowing a hole in the Albert Canal line far quicker than the Allied High Command had expected. Aided by this breakthrough, 6th Army made good progress into Belgium, and after only a couple of days, German forces had advanced as far as Hanu at the entrance to the Gembloo Gap. In the Netherlands, to the north of 6th Army's advance, 9th Panzer Division raced across the southern Netherlands towards the coast as the rest of 18th Army made steady progress west, initially inhibited by destroyed bridges. To the Allied High Command, these attacks and the heavy Luftwaffe presence looked extremely like the offensive they had planned for, and the first 24 hours of Plan D went to plan. The fastest Allied units reached the Dill by the evening of the 10th of May. The first major setback for the French occurred the following day. The 7th Army, having rushed almost 100 miles north, arrived near Breda to find no Dutch troops to link up with. Under severe pressure from the invading Germans, the Dutch had taken the decision to withdraw from the area and shorten their lines, unaware of the existence of the French Breda variant. Harried by the Luftwaffe and leading elements of the 9th Panzer Division, the Allies made the decision to withdraw south and abandon the Breda variant. While this fiasco was playing out in the north, Panzer Group Kleist began its advance to west, through Luxembourg and Belgium. They brushed aside the weak French and Belgian delaying forces to capture Neufchâteau on the 11th of May and establish bridgeheads over the Semois River by the early hours of the 12th. Despite hideously congested transport routes disrupting their logistics, the Germans pressed on, with 10th Panzer becoming the first division to reach the Meuse at Sedan on the evening of the 12th of May. Alongside this, to the north, 4th Army's leading 7th Panzer Division, commanded by one Erwin Rommel, also reached the Meuse late on the 12th at Dinant. Despite reports of the presence of German armour in the Ardennes region, the French High Command believed it to be a secondary offensive, and its attention remained fixed firmly north, 
as the German 6th Army attempted to break the Allied lines at Hanu, beginning on the 12th of May. This battle was crucial to both sides' plans as the French sought to delay the Germans long enough for their defences on the Dill line to be completed and the Germans aimed to pin down as many Allied divisions as possible to prevent them being used against Army Group A's advance. The largest tank battle of the campaign, Hanu saw a German force consisting largely of obsolete tank models outmaneuver and outwit a disorganised French force, breaking through their Hanu line on the 13th and rapidly advancing towards Gembleu in the heart of the still incomplete Dill line only four days after the beginning of the invasion. In the Netherlands, the situation for the Allies continued to deteriorate. As 9th Panzer reached the coast on the 12th of May, and cut the Dutch off from their allies in the south. As it became obviously hopeless, the Dutch government fled the country on the 13th, leaving a General Wunkerman to marshal what was left of the defenders and continue to fight to tie up as many German troops as possible before they finally surrendered on the 15th of May. While the intense German pressure in the north convinced Gamelan that it must be the main German thrust, in the Ardennes, Guderian prepared to launch his attack across the Mute. Although it was clear to the Allies by the evening of the 12th that the Germans had arrived on the river in force, it was thought that it would take several days for the Germans to be able to attempt a crossing, so this did not provoke great immediate concern. However, Heinz Guderian, the German commander at Sedan, had other ideas, and the German attack began at 4pm just the following day, only allowing a short break to allow divisions to catch up to Panzergruppe Kleist's leading elements. Accompanied by massive Luftwaffe air support, German infantry crossed the river, overwhelmed the defending French 55th Division and seized a strong bridgehead five miles deep on the southern bank in a stunning victory. Hasty counter-attacks were ordered overnight by the French, but delays in assembling the required forces meant that they struggled to coordinate their disorientated units, and over the next couple of days several French counter-attacks were overrun by advancing German tanks while they were still forming up. As Guderian's corps solidified its position south of Sedan, to the north the Germans won two additional important bridgeheads over the Meuse, at Dinant and also Montame, where 6th Panzer Division gained a small foothold by the 15th of May. As the Germans sought to consolidate and exploit their position, the French response was notable for its lethargy. French doctrine demanded that local commanders wait to receive precise written orders for attacks from high command, greatly restricting the speed at which French units could react to events. By contrast, the Wehrmacht gave its junior commanders the freedom to make tactical decisions themselves in pursuit of a more general goal set by higher command. The ethos of the German army lent itself to a quickness of action and reaction that the French just did not possess. With German tanks now across the Meuse in three separate places, the potential for a complete unhinging of the Allied line was there and it was precisely this that the Germans had in mind. In the concluding part of this series we will look at the events following on from these German landings, onwards to France's eventual capitulation in the middle of June. Thank you all very much for watching this inaugural episode of my History of Hearts of Iron series. I've been Adaway, and if you did enjoy the video please do like, comment, share with everyone, subscribe, it all will really help this series and if people show their support for this series I would love to make more and more videos uh, on history. Thank you all very much for watching and I will see you in the next video.